even that, I to say a few words to you people about the typhoon. Well, first I'll tell you a bit about the typhoon itself. The typhoon was the first British fighter fighter that could fly 400 miles an hour on a straight level. The Indians can't fly that fast. <laughs> Frank, well, it's, uh, it's only one fifth the size. <laughs> it had a 2400, 2200 horsepower engine swinging a 14 foot diameter prop, four bladed prop. <coughs> and uh, four bladed, <coughs> okay, that was the engine. And the armament on the aircraft, we carried two 1,000 pound bombs. We had four 20 millimeter cannon. Each cannon had 500, or the cannon had 560 rounds of ammunition. And we carried 154 gallons of gas to Texas Airborne for two hours. On the cannon, on the uh, cannon belt we had, we would fire until we got, we saw our five tracers. Twenty rounds from the end, we had five tracers. So, as soon as we got those, we might be a hundred miles from home. So, we take twenty rounds home with us. So, that means we'd fire 480 rounds each trip and drop the 2,000 pound rounds. <laughs> now, I've got a little, uh, a few little pictures here to show you. Uh, this is the tag end of an after dinner speech that I made, and it's got a, uh, <coughs> I, I picked up the typhoon part for you, okay? And I just turn around enough to see what's going on. <coughs> okay, I inherited the pulverizers. The, the, the lad that owned it was killed on August the 8th in another airplane. And when I took off and moved to the squadron on August the 10th, the pulverizer was sitting there. So I only had a, a few options, and nobody wanted the pulverizer because the fighter pilots want to name their own plane. But I liked the name, so I went to the CO and asked them if I could have it. And even though I only had a half a dozen trips in, he gave me the plane. <laughs> so that's how I got the pulverizer. But I don't think the first one was called pulverizer one. I, th I, would, I think it was called Pulverizer, but how would we know there was going to be four? <laughs> so, uh, go ahead. Can you hear me a minute this way? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's a, a picture of the beachhead. We were at B9. B9 here, uh, we're up, way up the top here. B9 was six miles from Juno Beach. We used to go down and swim on Yuna Beach. It was so close to the airport. So that's where we started out. We landed on B-9 when the Army made it safe for us. So that, as soon as we closed the gap and fell in, that was the first real big battle that the typhoons took part in. We closed the gap and fell in. And then we were given orders to go to St. Andrews. The army was, was moving up, so we went moved our our 80. Oh, the Typhoon Squadron consisted of 27 pilots and 18 aircraft. And we flew 16 aircraft as many times a day as we could. We could fly them three times a day or more down on the beach because the days were long. But in the winter time, we could only fly twice. We'd take off at first light, and the, the ground crew would have everything rearmed, ready to go after lunch. So we get in one more trip after lunch and you know, we'll short the day there. That would be the end of flying for the day. <laughs> anyway, we, we kept leapfrogging behind the army. See, we went to, uh, all the way up to Avian there and <clears throat> we were told to move from Avian to Brussels. <clears throat> On the way, uh, well, they sent us out late in the afternoon, and we were supposed to do what they call an arm recce on the way up to Brussels. We were loaded with two 500-pound bombs, and 
all the 20 millimeter amulets, and we were to go out over enemy territory and look for targets of opportunity. That was the usual procedure. So we went out there, and the clouds were getting lower and lower, and pushing us down. And finally, it started to rain. <coughs> And I heard the leader ask the uh, uh, deputy leader if he knew where we were. And his answer was negative. <laughs> so right away, we all knew that we were lost. <laughs> so in a few seconds, the leader comes on and says, steer 270 and land when you're running out of gas. Nine <laughs> of us, nine typhoons. So we flew towards the English Channel until we were running out of gas. <clears throat> And then we all went down in the field. <coughs> now, next, there's pulverizer one, or the pulverizer, on our belly in the field. Now, <coughs> next slide. You see that little kid in the cockpit? I sure hope I remember to turn the power off to the guns. <laughs> if he'd have put that button, those kids would have got a thrill out of it. <laughs> We hitchhiked our way to Brussels. The Americans drove us so far. Finally, we ended up that somebody drove us to the last part. But all the way along, this is a, a town called Chalroy. And uh, uh, you notice we, we had a German flag that we'd scored somewhere. And the French really got excited when they saw our Canada badges. But they couldn't understand how we could speak French. Neither of us could speak French. Two of us were doing, going up together. <laughs> but but we did three years work. Next slide. <clears throat> now, the Battle of the Bowls took part at around at Christmas, 1944. And uh, it was snowing, you know, how you've seen the Battle of the Bowls picture. And the Americans were taking the beating down there because they were, they were deprived of their air power. So, on the, when the, uh, uh, the weather cleared, they decided to send the typhoons down to help the Thunderbolts as air power for America. So they sent us all down there, uh, over 100 miles down to the Ardennes from Eindhoven and Holland. So, <coughs> on Christmas Day, I was straightening a tank. No. Oh, wait a minute. Is that, is that right. That's pulverizer, too. <laughs> <laughs> you see that? I do, I do. <laughs> I know, no nose art, I'm sorry. That's, that's a picture of pulverizer, too. <laughs> okay. I know. Oh, oh, wait a sorry, minute. sorry. You see those little <laughs> yellow patches, guys? Well, when you're flying along the uh, and the aircraft shells explode beside you. Hope they don't hit you. But when they explode beside you, they shower you with shrapnel. You see those little yellow patches? They're little bit like, that's how the, the ground crew passed up our flak holes. <laughs> I think there's about three on four on that side. <laughs> what, sorry, was it just tape or was it uh, sheets of alu aluminum? Pardon? What was the what was the patch made out of? Was it just a no, tape over top? Just guess. a beer can yeah. aluminum type thing. Yeah. And I don't know how they pat they put them on, but probably pop rivers or something. Yeah. Okay. You're going backwards. Oh no! Wait, <laughs> wait a minute. That's the Ardennes down there. I know on the way up there. What did that say? 137 kilometers. Yeah. That's how far we had to go and yeah. pack all. Our full load of bombs and ammunition to get down there. <laughs> now, that's the cover of the squadron history book. It's fine. There's all right in the cover. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I know. On Christmas Day, I was scraping the tank. Now, the artist and I were communicating. He's a lad in Edmonton. And he brought me the proof that he had made 
And I told him that tank commander wouldn't be looking under that tank. This is a little wrong because when you're straight from tanks and trucks and everything, you don't your wingman doesn't follow you like that. Your wingman is on his own. Everybody's on his own. Now until we you finish your ammunition, then you all come back together. But when we're fighting in the air, that's when the, the wingman is important. The wingman watches your tail. <coughs> When we were fighting on the ground, we hoped the Spitfires were up there watching over it. <coughs> yeah. Oh, that's all I had on the typhoon. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I hope none of you guys have any questions. <laughs>
pilot had to fly 100 operational trips to a tour. And, and you, uh, <coughs> we had to fly 32 trips a day. That was our squadron's share. There were 17 typhoon squadrons. There were the three Canadian squadrons, which were bombs. There were two British squadrons, which were bombs. And then what would that be? All British squadrons on rockets. So, <coughs> so that's what you had to do. So you can see that a lot of us had to fly like double to keep up our, our number. So there's nothing to fly two, two or three trips. There are always two, three trips a day. Everybody was happy to do that because you got to the end fast. <laughs> so, yeah, I love yeah. when I got an extra flight in. <coughs> yeah, so, <coughs> the way that the bombers, we were a bomber squadron. The way the bomber squadron operated, you would be assigned a, a primary target and a secondary target. And we would uh, go out. The Typhoon squadron flies in figure four formation, just like that, like the fingernails. And this group watched the sky over and under and behind this group, and this group watched vice versa. So that's how we protected each other on the way to the target, <coughs> on the way home. So anyway, when you get to the target, you have to work your way up to the magic height of 12,000 feet, which was a nice height to go over the front lines, because the, the, the little guys couldn't get there from the ground, but they shoot six shooters. And you're high enough, you had a chance to fly. So, but you had the bomb from 8,000 to 4,000. So we would slowly let down the 8,000 as we approached the target. And then when we bombed, you would bomb straight down. You've got to go straight down to hit the target. Any pilots in here? Any of you guys want to try it? I'll tell you what. You try to go straight down. You can't go straight down, but if you do, you're lucky, and as soon as you get in the straight position, you fall forward in your straps, you see? And we call it hanging in the straps. Boy, if you hung in your straps, you bragged about it. <laughs> but you never get it straight down. So anyway, we, uh, then we, we go down, and at 4,000 feet, you drop, drop the bombs, and pull out. Now, <coughs> if we were attacking a heavily defended target, like a bridge, for instance, that was our worst target. We always lost somebody on a bridge. We would dive from 11 to 6, drop the bombs at 6 hours. The way they, the enemy had it figured out, they would put a ring of anti-aircraft guns around the bridge, and they would fire to a point about a mile high, maybe 5,000 feet, all the guns would fire at the point. They wouldn't aim at the typhoon because they knew we had to come down through that if we were going to hit the bridge. So we always would lose somebody on the bridge. <coughs> so what else? <sighs> bridge. Any questions? <laughs> 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 uh, Is that full power? Going straight down? No, no, you would you dive up one third from. Oh, I see. Yeah. One third from. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why one third, but that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. the way we did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How fast were you coming out of those dives? The, 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 the machine is, maybe you got it on your engine. It's red line at 525 miles an hour. Okay. And when I'd be at, at the pull out stage, she'd just be. Ticking. The needle would be ticking the red line. Oh, wow. So you were really dangling and you'd pull. You'd pull so hard that you would gray out. Yeah. Never black out. But you could tell as soon as you start to gray, yeah. slack off. Oh, yeah. Even if you hit the ground, it's better to slack off. <laughs> <laughs> no, guys. So, Harry, uh, can you tell us what happened to Pulverizer 2? Well, yeah, Pulverizer Two with the one that I built. Yeah, and where where is it uh, maybe now? Where was that? What happened to it, and where was that? Well, uh, I got it back to Holland. But what happened was uh, when I was just coming out of the, the run after scraping that tank, the tail was blew up, but all ragged. See? So, but I could still hold a stick and the rudders, and I I was on the way up. 
If I had been hit on the way down, it would have been curtains, you know. But I was hit on the way up. So I climbed it up to 7,000 feet and aimed it back to Holland. And I got all the way back to Eindhoven. And there's a little town of Key just outside of Eindhoven. Well, I tried, you know, it was out of control. I had a hold on to it. So I decided I had to bail out. So I pulled the rejection lever and that bubble stop goes off and the far side goes, the whole side is gone on the top of it. And then I, this, I was holding on to the stick to keep it flying and I looked at the, at the airspeed and it gave, it was 174 miles an hour. And I could still hold on to it, but I thought I couldn't hold on to it more than, uh, less than 200 miles. But I got it down to 174 before I bailed it. And then I just laid over on the on the wing and slid down the wing on my belly and I missed the tail. <laughs> just lucky, you know. A lot of people were killed hitting the tail. But that's how we bail out of a tight run. Normally, you, to bail out of a fighter, you know the, the rules. You get rid of the hood and you butt your way out. But you can't if you can't tie. And do you, you remember what day that was? Do you remember the date? It was Christmas Day! <laughs> <laughs> can't forget the day! <laughs> All right. I'll tell you a little fact that I don't know. We've got time for that? Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a fellow wrote me from Germany. Ted is communicating with him right now. And uh, he's finding, his hobby is finding crashed airplanes in Europe. And he's found 350 of them, and he he had found a type uh, a typhoon, and he knew that I knew the the pilot would, would be when he when he crashed. Somehow he found that out, and he wrote us a letter. Ted, Ted is communicating with him, so I sent him all the information he wanted on this fellow typhoon pilot. And I sent him all the information on my bailer and told him within a kilometer. Yeah. Where that plane is. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, we haven't heard back, eh? No, I haven't sent anything. No, yet. nothing. I haven't heard You people. mailed the package to him, eh? Yeah, yeah, but I hope he gives you a little bit of 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 Anybody else?